Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. And welcome to this very special Cornerstone Faith Community Church Revival Service. We are so glad to be gathered together with you tonight. You know, for as long as there have been churches here in America, uh, folks have been gathering together, meeting together like we are, in special services like this, for the purpose of seeking God and asking Him for revival. To spark a revival within the church, uh, to spark a revival once again in the church, in the hearts of the people who live in our neighborhoods and in our towns. The purpose of this particular service tonight is, is threefold. The first purpose is that we come together tonight to sing of the wonderful mercy and grace and love of Jesus. So I hope you caught that first word, right? We're going to sing tonight. We are going to sing, right? The second thing is we come together to be reminded that Jesus has done amazing things for us. Tonight is about reminding us what Jesus has done for us in his life, in his death, and his resurrection. The third reason for us to get together tonight is that we can be reminded once again of the work of Jesus and that it is not over. He has more work to do. He's coming back soon to do it. Jesus will come back again. And so each of us had better be ready when that great day comes, right? So we ask you to come together tonight so that we can be reminded of God's love for us, his gift for us in Jesus Christ, his son, his promise that this world is not all that we have because Jesus is coming soon. So he's going to come. He's going to take us to be with him forever, and tonight is a great night to be reminded of that and for us to sing together. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory Living me. 
one day Jesus is coming back again. We have this blessed assurance, this blessed hope, this, this wonderful spirit that tells us that he loves us. God so loved us that he gave us his son, and that son is coming back for us one day. Let's sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is. Romans 5, 1 through 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Let's stand and sing together tonight the truth that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us.
Two were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Sing about how redeemed. Redeemed how I let you proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Brothers and sisters, let's go before the Lord. Father, what an incredible opportunity we have to come and sing your praises. Father, if we start this night in any other way but recognizing our own sinfulness, we would be foolish to even be here. The truth of the matter is that we have indeed sinned against you. We have sinned against you in thought, in word, in deed. By what we've done, by what we've left undone, we have said wrong things, we've done wrong things. But the beauty of your gospel for us, and that's our focus tonight, is Jesus. Jesus changed all of that. And so, Father, we thank you for the incredible goodness, the wonderful mercy, the incredible grace of Jesus, our Savior. We thank you that we can come and stand right before you again. We can be revived. We can be restored. We can be brought back to right relationship with you if we will just trust Jesus. If we will just trust you fully, your will and your word and your ways. And so, Father, tonight, may this time of singing, this time of hearing the word be a time that revives our souls that reignites a fire in us for you. Because we need it, Father, so desperately. We need to feel you and know that you move in us. And so, Father, take our prayers and our thoughts, our words and our actions, and revive us again, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Church choir is singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation, oh, and it's beautiful. I got an old church choir 
Gonna steal my joy. Amen, amen. <laughs> Do it again. There we go. Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to spend some time in God's word tonight, I would ask that you would stand wherever you are this evening, that by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of the living God, we would hear the word of God, that it would move freely through us, and that it would spur us on to action. Tonight we read from Psalm 85 beginning at the first verse. This psalm is dedicated as to the director of music, written by the sons of Korah. You, O Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all of their sins. You set aside all of your wrath. And you turned from your fierce anger. Oh, restore us again, God our Savior. And put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord. And grant us your salvation. For I will listen to what God the Lord says as he promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in all of our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and the righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Apparently your pastor is not accustomed to leading vocally. <clears throat> but one Monday morning, after a citywide revival weekend, three pastors were sitting around a table at a local coffee shop discussing the weekend's events and their immediate perception of how successful the revival services in their churches had been. Now, the first pastor said, well... We found this weekend to be a great success. You see, after our revival service last night, we brought four new families into the church. Praise God. The second pastor said, well, that's really great. But I hate to tell you, we had much better success at our revival services. 
As a matter of fact, we saw three people accept Jesus, come forward and receive Christ as Savior. And we brought six new families into the church. The third pastor listened intently. And then he suddenly spoke up. He says, well, I got you all beat. You know, my church is kind of old-fashioned. And well, that rocking music that the worship leader played at our church service, well, as a result of that, and as a result of our revival service, I was able to get rid of six complaining families in the church. Amen? Amen. Yeah, good. Brothers and sisters, revival in the church is not a new concept. In fact, I would argue that the very first revival in the church came that night that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. God saw the condition of his people, most importantly the condition of their hearts, and he gave the gift of his son to awaken the people, to revive their hearts, to restore their lives, to renew their steadfast love for him. But but even still, throughout the history of the church, there's been this great controversy over the idea of revival. Some people would question whether it's a biblical concept. Others would wonder whether it's necessary. Some are excited by the focused time of worship, seeking, praying, asking for the movement of the Holy Spirit to awaken the hearts of God's people, that they would see him, that they would find him anew once again. And there are other people that put revival into the category of showmanship. And they deem it unnecessary. They suggest that revival should just naturally happen whenever the believers get together. But you see, the truth is that every Sunday morning, there are myriads of people looking for answers, looking for inspiration, who would never even darken the door of a church unless some kind of particular purposeful event, like a revival, was held for them. By the way, every Sunday morning, there are hearts that sit within the walls of the church. There are hearts that sit within the walls of this church that are desperately in need of awakening, reawakening, revival, reignition of that fire for Jesus Christ. And so as such, the church, in many of its instances, continues to practice the discipline of gathering together to ask God for revival. Are there churches still looking at those churches as if they're funny? Wondering what the purpose of those services might be? There are. After all, they would say, how many times are there churches that are hosting revival services just hoping, praying that somebody, anybody, would walk through the door of the church that is ready to receive Jesus for the very first time. And after the service has ended, that they would come forward and they would pray. And those people who are skeptical of revival would say, how many times do people hope for this and yet nobody ever comes forward? Beginning on September 13th, 1947, in the Civic Auditorium of Grand Rapids, Michigan, a young Bible college graduate and an itinerant pastor offered two weeks of evangelistic services. The express purpose, the express hope of these services was to introduce Jesus to a nation that desperately needed a savior. His name was the Reverend Billy Graham, and he hosted his first ever evangelistic crusade for 14 days. On the first night, hundreds of people received Jesus as savior. By the time that first crusade ended, thousands had come to know the Savior. 
And 58 years later, in 2005, in New York City, America's pastor, Billy Graham, would host his 417th and final evangelistic crusade. Some estimates suggest that more than one billion people came to know Jesus because of Billy Graham's preaching. And still there are those who say that coming together for the express purpose of revival is not necessary. It's redundant. I want to focus our time tonight by offering a different perspective on revival. And I'll begin with this. Revival isn't just something that we hope for. Revival is a desperate need for our church and for the whole world. Even still, some of you may be wondering what exactly is revival? Why are we doing this? You aren't, you're not arguing with the, the desperate need for reignition, fire, Holy Spirit, but what is revival? The English Standard Dictionary defines the word revival this way, that it is an improvement in the condition or the strength of something. An improvement in the condition or the strength of something, I do not disagree. Neither does the church and neither does the Bible. When we come together in moments like these tonight, in services like these, right? How weird was it not coming to church at 10 o'clock this morning, right? When we come together in moments like this for the express purpose of asking God to improve our condition, strengthen our hearts. That's revival. But you see, the church has historically had a little bit different take on the idea of revival. Well, a deeper take, one step deeper perhaps. You see, in the church, revival is usually meant a renewed religious fervor. It's a word we don't use too often, so I gave you the meaning there, passion, okay? Or a revitalized spiritual ardor, also a word we don't use very often, Enthusiasm. We would say that the reason that we plan for and execute revival services is that we desperately need, desperately desire, and desperately need renewed passion and enthusiasm for the Spirit of God. In other words, we might say that we plan revival services like this one tonight to help to continue the thaw of God's once Frozen, chosen. Amen. These services are designed to incite enthusiasm, foster excitement, but not just for fancy music, not just for fancy worship teams with all kinds of new instruments and stuff, not even just for fancy preachers. These are services that are intended to grow excitement for Jesus Christ, for God's word, for the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit, for sharing Jesus with a world that is in desperate need of him. One last little thought about how we would define the word revival. While the church defines revival as seeking God for renewed passion, renewed enthusiasm. God's word actually goes a, another step further because in the Bible, the, uh, the, the term revival is defined as the awakening or the quickening of God's people to their true and natural purpose. You guys remember in the Apostles' Creed, some of you were taught to memorize that by saying, and the quick and the dead, right? Did you ever wonder what that meant? They just got up and ran like, you know, Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote? Or what does that mean, right? The quick, the alive. So revival, as far as the Bible is concerned, is the awakening or the alivening, the quickening of God's people. When Israel had been unrepentant in their sin, God turned his face away from them. We see that time and time again in Scripture. Whether it was the army of Israel that was defeated by enemies and adversaries, or it was a particular person of Israel, maybe like David, for example. 
who turned his face away from God and fell deeply into sin. Sin separates God's people from God. There are no two ways about that truth. But even though our sin creates a chasm between God and us, God never leaves that chasm without a bridge. That bridge is called grace. And it's kind of like a toll bridge, not a troll bridge, a toll bridge. The toll of that grace-bringing bridge is repentance, confession. And the reward on the opposite side of that bridge is forgiveness. When we sin, we become temporarily unable to be used by God. Not because God somehow decided we had no use anymore or didn't want to use us in that moment, but because we were blinded by our sin. We have offended God with our sin and our lives. And so when we reject God's will for our lives, when we sin, when we choose instead our own will, we do whatever we want to do, what, no matter what God says, and that's, that's sin. It separates us from God. So it stands to reason, if you ask me, that we would, as the people of God, come together from time to time to ask that God would actually turn us back toward his face. That he would turn his face back toward us. And if there is any hope for this kind of turnaround, for God's face to once again turn towards us, we are going to need a little help, aren't we? And some of you are like, yeah. Some of you are like, a little. (laughs) A little. A lot of help. And that's where revival begins, right? Where we finally realize our woeful inability in our own power and our desperate need for Jesus. That's where the Holy Spirit of the living God moves so powerfully. That's where revival comes to fruition, whether it's our first ever awakening or our 100th awakening. No matter how many times we have been revived, as David prayed in our text for today, we need God to restore us once again, to revive our hearts one more time. And this is where we find David in Psalm 85. That's our text for today. This is where David's troubled heart has leaned on its own understanding instead of resting firmly on God. Psalm 85 is accredited to this group called the Sons of Korah. These are brothers who served as royal musicians in King David's court, but their words are not simply about themselves. Their words reflect what they have seen in their king, what they have seen in the hearts of the people, what they have seen in their own hearts. So what do their words tell us? Well, there is this desperate need for the favor of God. There is a desperate plea for the unfailing love of God. They have a sure and confident hope in the salvation of God. And and the love and the faithfulness of the people of God builds them up when they get together. In other words, when sin creeps in, what the church so desperately needs is to know the love of God. And to once again feel the favor of God and the fortune of God. To remember their salvation, to dwell together as the people of God. But the sons of Korah, and King David said it best, the best antidote for a broken world is the revival of our God. Amen? So, since we've defined what revival is, let me spend what little time I have left tonight to give you four simple reasons that you need revival in your life. Because revival in the church, capital C, has to begin with revival in me. Revival, first of all, comes as the gift of God's favor 
and his fortunes. The sons of Korah told us this. Psalm 85 is entirely about revival. Every line, every word, and the sons of Korah open this psalm by recalling a simple truth. When our hearts are revived by God, we are immediately reminded of the favor and the fortune of our God. And let me ask you a question. Who in their right mind would ever reject the favor or the fortune of God? Right? Huh. We do, though, don't we? We do. We reject the favor and the fortune of God. We reject the favor of God constantly. How do we do that? Well, we sin. Every time we live outside of God's word and his will, we reject his favor. Essentially, our actions say to God, hey, listen, I know that you're the God of everything, who has everything and is everything and creates everything and gives everything. But you know what? It's a hard pass for me. I'm good. I'll just do my thing. And you do yours. As such, it's no wonder that people say that they feel like God doesn't listen when they ask. Or, or he doesn't provide when they have a need. Favor and fortune come part and parcel with revival. When our hearts are aligned with God, alive in God, a fire for God then God's favor follows. But when our hearts are aligned with selfish desires, living only for personal gain and prosperity, there is no fire for God, and therefore our, our life lacks favor. Apart from God's favor, our life lacks the fortunes of God. And that leads me to the second point for today. Sons of Korah, in verse 2, they wrote this. They said, you forgave the iniquity of your people, and you covered all their sins. Some of you, I know some of you grew up in the Lutheran church. You'll remember that part of the Sunday service. Thou forgavest the iniquity of all thy people's sins, right? That comes from Psalm 85. Why did these royal musicians write such words? Well, William MacDonald says in the Believer's Bible Commentary, he says, confession is an invariable moral necessity before anything else can take place. Nothing can take place in the house of God until confession of sin has taken place. So the second point for today is this. Revival then requires us to seek God's forgiveness. It requires us to seek God's forgiveness. There's a simple truth that can be applied to every word of the Bible. Ready? Blessing does not come without contrition. I know. It's, that word sounds like super high church, right? Kind of Catholic-y. That word contrition what in the world is contrition? The act of feeling remorse over an errant action. Remember what David said? Create in me a contrite heart, O oh God. We can restore a right spirit within me. The act of feeling remorse over an errant action. In other words, the blessings of God are for the people of God, and repentance of sin identifies the people of God for whom God's blessings flow. Imagine, if you will, for just a moment, okay? that your child has come home with a new significant other, all right? Your child has come home with a new significant other. Now, this boyfriend or girlfriend, as the case may be, is a perfectly nice person. In fact, you really like them, all right? You quickly become friends. In short order, their relationship grows. Your relationship with this person grows. You start to think, you know, marriage is a very real possibility here. Now let's imagine for a moment that in the midst of this courtship experience, you are diagnosed with a life-threatening disease. Your doctor suggests to you that you should probably go and get your affairs put into order. So you spend some time determining how your assets will be divided after your death. 
You give something to your children. You give something to your grandchildren. You leave a little for the church. But what about this significant other? Are you likely to leave something for a significant other of your child who is not yet your child by marriage? Unlikely, right? Unlikely. But let's say for a moment that that child of yours is married to that person. Let's say that they are married and the same situation occurs. Then what? Might you be more inclined to leave something to your child and their spouse? You likely would. So what makes the difference? Marriage. Marriage makes the difference. And the reason that marriage makes the difference is because marriage is a covenantal relationship. It binds together two hearts as one, two families as one. Well, you see, forgiveness works the same way. Forgiveness is a covenantal relationship between God and his people. Those who earnestly seek God and earnestly seek his forgiveness, they enter into covenant with him. Which covenant? Well, friends, you've heard it so many times. That covenant that says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's what forgiveness wins for us. A restoration, as David says, to a right spirit with God, the revival of our hearts once more. So revival comes as the gift of God's favor and his fortune and requires us to seek God's forgiveness. But our third point for today is this. Revival also demonstrates relief from God's fierce anger. Revival demonstrates relief from God's fierce anger. Perhaps the greatest reason that the sons of Korah give us in Psalm 85 for the purpose or the necessity of seeking God's revival in us is a reminder that we have been forgiven. When we live our lives in light of God's unceasing forgiveness for those who repent, we demonstrate to the world that God is indeed the God of love as much as he is the God of fierce anger and wrath. If I had a dollar for every person who has suggested that God is full of wrath and vengeance rather than love, I would be a millionaire. This world believes that God is full of wrath. Of course, when we only read or only pay attention to particular passages, and particularly the Old Testament, God can seem to be full of vengeance and wrath. But the truth about our God is that he is filled with wrath for those who have rejected him. So it's, it's sort of simple. It's like reject God, feel his wrath. That's what happens. But that's not the only God that we see in Scripture. That is not the only way that we see God interact with his people. In fact, even when God is pouring out wrath, that outpouring of wrath is still born out of his love for his people. You see, God so loves his people but just like any other parent of a child, sometimes it, that love has got to be hard love. Fierce anger kind of love. Tough love. Life lesson kind of love. Sometimes the most loving thing God can do for us is to love us with his fierce anger. I noticed nobody shouted amen after that. He has to have anger for our sin. He has to have anger for our waywardness. He has to have anger for our fickle hearts so that we can change our allegiance. If we never seek out God, if we never ask for his forgiveness, if we never seek out revival from him, then we never show the world that God is indeed, yes, a God of fierce anger, but he is also the God who, as the sons of Korah said today, relents from his fierce anger. Because you see, when Adam ate the apple, right? When Adam ate the apple, God banished them from the garden. But that's not where the story ended. 
God taught Adam to work the ground, to toil over it, that he would have plants for food. That was the reward of the, of the curse. When God became angry with Israel, he sent them back into the wilderness instead of bringing them home into the promised land. But after Israel confessed their sin to God, God raised up Joshua. And the people walked into the promised land. David, he sinned against Uriah and against Bathsheba. And God promised to bring calamity on his house. He took David's wives, he gave them to his kinsmen. The mark of the murderer's sword remained with David and his house. The child who was the result of David's time with Bathsheba died. But then David confessed his sins to God. And he confessed his sin to Bathsheba. And God gave him Bathsheba as his wife. And she bore to him a son, the great King Solomon. In each of these instances, God's fierce anger was relieved. But what was it that relieved such fierce anger? Repentance and forgiveness. What happened to the hearts after that repentance and that forgiveness? Reignition. A fire for God. They went from mere burning, smoldering embers to a roaring fireplace for God. Listen, brothers and sisters, the world knows well enough that our God can be a God of fierce anger. The world believes that God, if he is anything at all, is full of anger and rage and vengeance. But when we call on our God and we ask him to revive our hearts once again, we are enabled, we are enabled once again, we are revived to demonstrate that our God is not just the God of fierce anger. He is indeed a God who relents from his fierce anger. And so we can be returned to right relationship with him. We can confess our sin. And hear me, he will always forgive. Always. So one last truth for tonight. Revival is exactly what we need in order that we would have a reason to rejoice again. Revival is what we need in order that we would have a reason to rejoice again. Just yesterday, I saw three posts on Facebook that seemed to paint a picture that the church is nothing but a smoldering ember rather than a burning fire. Here they are. The first is this. A church in the northern suburbs of Chicago announced that it would not be meeting in person today. There were some things that happened over the past week, and COVID seems to have stricken the staff and many of the folks at the church. As such, there would be no morning gathering. This week's study and fellowship events are questionable. The world sees that and says the church is smoldering, right? There's a rural church downstate Illinois that announced that it would be listing its building for sale in the coming days. The church will be disbanding. The Post cited that this drastic decrease in attendance and then, of course, as a result in giving, as a result of the COVID pandemic, has forced them to close their doors. And there was a church in central Nebraska that was reported to have been taken over recently by a group of liberally-minded theologians. They have sought to move this historically evangelical reformed congregation, as they say, into the 21st century in an appropriate way of understanding God now. Interestingly enough, I didn't realize that the way to understand God had changed at any time in, let's say, the last 6,000 years, right? My point is this. We are not merely here tonight so that I can define for you what revival is or that I can discuss with you the reasons that we should or should not continue to meet together and hold revival services. I believe that God has called us here tonight with greater purpose that he might ignite us, that he might ignite in you a holy fire, a holy fire in this place 
and that he might revive our hearts once again. Over the past month or so, I have had numerous communications with folks who were either new to this church family or they were connected to this church family through a third party from the outside. These are folks who are seeing this church from a viewpoint that many of you who sit in these pews every Sunday morning may not be able to see. Every single one of these communications, these conversations, Every single one. And I went back and checked. I am not exaggerating. Every single one of these had some variation of this comment. It really seems like God is getting ready to do something incredible in your church. Those of us in leadership here, we have believed that for the better part of 10 years, have we not? I have trusted that since August 12th of 2012 when Sarah, Ethan, and I embarked on this journey with you. There was a recent email sent to me by a friend of the congregation that said this. I also wanted to say something to you. Jesus is doing things in your church. And I can feel that. It is such an incredible feeling when someone outside of this particular family of God can see movement within the walls of this place, but their vision does us so little good if we can't see Jesus moving in us. Until we can feel the Spirit moving in this place, until we believe that God really, truly is at work within this place, and more importantly, within us, their words do us no good. Do you know that exactly nine years ago today, exactly nine years ago, this very day, I stood at this very pulpit, I preached in this very room. And I want to share with you just one paragraph from my message that morning. I said, I think that if we could know with certainty the will of God, life would be easier. However, I think it also then stands to reason that faith would be nothing. You see, it is in the waiting and the seeking that our faith is both strengthened and proven. And so I asked this congregation, are we faithful enough to wait on God and his perfect will? Brothers and sisters, I am here tonight to tell you we have waited. We have waited. Some of us, and sometimes with patience and others with less, We have sought the Lord. We have submitted ourselves to his leading, to his word, to his will. Whereas the question for us on that particular morning was, are we faithful enough to wait? The question before each and every one of us today is this. Are we faithful enough to believe that God is ready to move? Are we faithful enough to believe that God is ready to move? And therefore, I must ask this, are we able to trust him enough so that we fully stand in expectation, faithful, eager expectation of the movement of God's Holy Spirit amongst us? You see, I don't disagree with that email writer. Jesus is doing something in this place. My only question for us is, are we willing To ask him to do those things in our hearts and through our lives. Because you see, if I had said that the last 10 years of ministry in this place had not been difficult, had not been filled with its toils and its snares of every kind, I would be flat out lying to you. I would be lying for myself, for the leadership, for those faithful men who have served as our president through those times, and I would be lying for you. 
But tonight we have an opportunity literally placed in our laps. We have the opportunity to turn those wailing moments into moments of dancing. We stand with the opportunity before us to turn a a time that has sometimes seemed like it's been filled with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth into a future filled with holy laughter and joy and the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. Brothers and sisters, we desperately need revival in this place and in our hearts and in our lives. Not because what we experience is so terrible. In fact, the journey that we have been on, I believe it has made us stronger for what we have experienced. But we need in this place what the old gospel singer and songwriter Joel Hemphill calls an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, devil-chasing, dedicating Holy Ghost revival, touching me and touching you. We need a sin-erasing, restoration, Holy Ghost revival. Send it, Lord, our souls renew. Revival is what we need in this place. Revival comes as the gift of God's favor when we seek his forgiveness and his fierce anger towards us subsides. We need revival tonight, this very moment. You don't get to wait until you walk out the doors and think about it and let it sit and percolate right now, this moment. We need the Holy Ghost to move in this place. Amen? Amen. And we need that revival so that we may rejoice together once again. Let's pray together. Father God, we need the powerful movement of the Holy Spirit in this place, that it would erase our sin, that it would chase the devil away from here, that it would come and help us to dedicate our lives to you. Father, we so desperately, eagerly want to know your favor and your fortune in this place. So will you lead us? Will you cause us to fall to our knees in humble supplication before you? Will you help us to recognize the thing that separates us from you, the thing that separates us from revival in our hearts and in this place is sinfulness? It doesn't mean we're a bunch of bad people. It just means that we're normal human people who sin. And we need you. Oh, how we need you. We need your love. We need your fierce anger toward us. We need your son, Jesus Christ, who restores us. And Father, we need your Holy Spirit to powerfully, faithfully, wonderfully move us. Lord, may this place be yours and yours alone. May what happens in this place be only for your glory. May our hearts be yours and yours alone. May what we do be only for your glory. Father, use us. Grow us. Add to our number. Open the doors of this place and flood it with people who desperately need Jesus like we do. And Father, when those folks come and we wonder what we're going to say or how we're going to respond or how they'll respond to us, will you give us, Father, an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, sin-erasing, devil-chasing, Holy Ghost revival? We ask this in Jesus' precious name and by the power and the movement of your Holy Spirit. Now, the front end of our worship was kind of cool, right? 
It was good music. It was exciting. Y'all sang like a bunch of people who live north of the Mason-Dixon line. Can we get up and sing tonight, do you think? Can we sing together as the church? Can we see the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place? Let's sing together. of the Lord tonight. Really? I said the goodness of God, the wondrous love of Jesus. And oh, goody, yay, wonderful. <laughs> Let's hear a shout of praise in the house. Let's go. Yes. Brothers and sisters, as you go from this place, revive. Seeking desperately that revival of the Holy Ghost in this place. We pray that you would go. That you would turn away from sin. That God could relent from his fierce anger. And that you would go with the love of God our Father. And the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. Revived in you every single day. Amen. Now, we forgot to tell you, there's dinner tonight, right? <laughs> Meet us in the beacon room because we got a lot of food. It's going to be wonderful. Good time of fellowship. That's where the spirit moves to, but let's sing together first. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Father, so 
wonderful week. We'll see you next week at our regular time.